We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. The sea is a scary place. It's an unforgiving place. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people, ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When that pager goes off, it's like that. There they are! There they are! You are somebody's last hope. He's gone under! I have never felt so much admiration. Marvel heroes don't come anywhere near. Equipped with their own cameras. Am I recording? Yep. The crews give us a unique insight into every call out as only they see it. Sorry, let me get you home, all right? For those who risk their lives, it has become a way of life. There's no better feeling than knowing that you've brought someone's loved one home safely. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Hold on! One hundred and sixty miles southeast is the city of Portsmouth, which lies on Port Sea Island in the Solent. The port's strategic position in the Channel has given it a central role in naval history. At the height of the British Empire, it was the world's most fortified military base. Today, the local lifeboat crew keep the seas safe from their base on Langstone Harbour. Right, chappies. We're just practicing some rope work. If you can, uh, all tie bowling for us. 24-year-old Brittany has been volunteering here for over five years. So I'm from Portsmouth, lived here all my life, uh, grew up here. It's basically an island filled with water around it. <laughs> Busy station here as well. A lot of the time in the summer, you're kind of looking more for casualty care jobs or people going missing and spending a bit more time out on the water, and we'll go and search for them. The Portsmouth lifeboat station is at the centre of three linked natural harbours, between them home to hundreds of dinghies and yachts. You've got people out there that are really experienced and yet stuff still goes wrong. So sometimes we are our worst enemy, but then sometimes things just go wrong. A warm day in June. The inland waters appear calm. But beyond the harbour, a strong wind is creating choppy seas with large swells. A call comes into the station. Two dinghies have capsized. Four people are in the water over a mile out to sea. The casualties that we went out to were quite a long way offshore for the size of boats they're in. I think the, the wooden dinghies they're in were 10 to 12 foot long, so they weren't big. Sailing dinghies had the potential to sink. I wouldn't say that they were in the, the safest place that they could be. When you capsize, it's a lot more serious and a lot more time critical that you need to get there because someone can drown in 90 seconds. It's really important that you get there quickly. It was quite choppy. The wind had picked up a little bit as well, so it was, you know, you're kind of thinking, how far have they drifted? Um, you know, have they managed to get any of their boats back up yet? You know, are they with their boats, or is it four singular people in the water just kind of bobbing around and we've got to search for them and try and find each one? It takes four minutes for the Atlantic class to reach the casualty's last known location. But there's only one dinghy and just two people clinging on. A passing motorboat has picked up the other two sailors, but this dinghy has now drifted over a half a mile away from their friends. As we got to the first casualties, they were pointing over to where this motorboat was. But as we were with them and the fact that the other casualties were in or on another vessel, we went for the first capsized boat as they were still in the water and the other ones weren't. The challenge now is getting these two men out of the water. It can be quite difficult depending on like the size of your casualty. 
especially when you've got you know kit on that then weighs them down as well so they've got you know water on their kit or soaked into their kit so it weighs a bit more once you start lifting them out of the water the exhausted casualties have been clinging onto their dinghy in choppy seas for nearly an hour There we go. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh. I'll hold that one. When you're dealing with people in the water, you kind of just look at getting them in and assessing how they are, if they were cold at all, um, have they swallowed any water, have they inhaled any water, just to see if they're going to need treatment from us. With two casualties now safe, the crew must locate the other members of their group. But as the lifeboat approaches the motor cruiser, it becomes clear that one of these sailors is not completely out of danger yet. I saw that there was one gent sitting on the back of the swim deck, um, and the lady that was on the boat had handed him a towel. I thought at first it was just to kind of dry him off a little bit. Um, and as we got a bit closer, he said that he'd hurt his leg. Crew member needs to board the motor cruiser to properly assess the sailor's injury. But as they come alongside, they learn that this boat has problems of its own. The motorboat had actually got a, uh, a rope around its propeller, so it was just drifting in the swell and with the wind. They'd only just picked up that motorboat that day, so they were quite new to that boat themselves and uh, had attempted to rescue them, got into a sticky situation themselves. Manoeuvring the 27-foot, 1.8-ton lifeboat alongside a drifting vessel in these seas is no mean feat. But Lewis must get Brittany on board. The laceration that he had, it was a bit more than just a cut. It was, it was quite big, I'd probably say maybe six to seven inches um, long. There were quite a lot of waves kind of coming over and almost washing the blood off. Um, but he was also quite cold as well. Um, so that was, I believe, kind of almost stemming the bleeding that was coming out. I asked for a first aid kit um, to be sent over along with another crew member. Kim joins Brittany on the motor cruiser. He did seem quite kind of relaxed, but I think it was more just trying to keep himself calm. He was quite cold as well. We did need to get his leg treated properly because we, we can only do so much on the boat. While Kim runs preliminary medical checks, Brittany dresses the man's laceration. Can you imagine getting out of a swimming pool onto the side? He tried to do that onto the boat, but as he was doing it, he'd actually caught his leg on the propeller. The injured sailor Phil and his crewmate Paul were adrift in the sea for nearly an hour before the motor cruiser spotted them. The reason the dinghy capsized was mainly because a freak gust of wind just come straight at us. There was no warning. Initially, it was quite worrying. My heart did pump and my adrenaline did kick in. It was just total shock. Without the life jacket, I wouldn't be here now talking about it. I wasn't too sure how far we were getting dragged out because you get quite disorientated and getting tired, getting very, very tired. As time went by, I was getting colder and colder and colder, and I was thinking, is there anybody going to come and get us? I did say to Phil, we need some help soon, because I'm not too sure how long I can hold on for. I was just so pleased when this passing vessel come in to get us. Phil's leg needs urgent medical attention. So the priority now is to get him and Paul off this boat. But while Paul can board with little assistance, the bigger challenge is transferring a wounded man off a broken down motor cruiser, which without engine power is now rolling in increasingly choppy seas.
the injured guy, we managed to get him up and onto his feet. He was actually pretty good. He managed to hop over quite elegantly, actually. <laughs> Finally, four casualties, two dinghies and a drifting motor cruiser were all transported back to harbour. The guys were reasonably lucky to be spotted by the passing motorboat. If the vessel had sunk, then we'd have run the risk that we were just effectively looking for heads in the water. They could have been out there until like the hours of darkness. If they started to like lose consciousness, they might have drifted away from their boat. They wouldn't have stayed with that. They might have let go and yeah, trying to find four people that aren't with their boats compared to four people that are with their boat is a lot harder. <laughs> How lucky was it that day? It's the closest I've come to death, I think. Um, yes, very lucky. You're clear, you're clear. Safely ashore, the casualties are met by a waiting ambulance crew. The people that we rescued, they came round to every crew member afterwards and said their thanks, which for us, it means a lot. I met Phil a couple of weeks ago. We had a little survivor's drink down in Eastbourne. Um, Phil's OK, because the wound was quite wide. It's still healing, but hopefully he should be back fighting fit soon. Four lives have been saved today, but the Portsmouth crew won't be able to return to their families and friends just yet. We've got another job to go to, so uh, hop back on. <laughs> no rest on a Sunday, then. Oh, no, never is. <laughs> By the time we got back from the second shout, it must have been about 7 o'clock. Yeah, my barbecue was finished. <laughs>